Hello and welcome. I'm really excited about today's app. My name is Mark Lassoff. We're going to be using the Google Maps API and the Google Places API to create an application that's great for mobile. This application will show you where you are on a Google Map and it'll show you the locations of all the nearby restaurants. Then when you click on a nearby restaurant, it gives you more information about the restaurant itself. If you really enjoy these application development videos, I'd encourage you to go ahead and hit the like button now, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment. Let's get started. All right, so we'll start off by running the app. So I'm going to run my server here in the command line, simple HTTP server on port 8000. And then we'll access it through localhost 8000. And there we go. Here you can see a map of the area around our office. And if I click on any of the individual pins, it gives me the name of the restaurant, the address, the price, and the rating on a five point scale. So up here, that's Bobby Q's Q and Company at 11 Merwin Street, Norwalk. Price is $2 signs, ratings 4.1. That's a hibachi grill. There's Beach House Sono. So you get the idea of exactly how this works. So it does find your individual location, and then it goes ahead and gives you pins for all of the local restaurants. So let's take a look at the code we use to make this. So we essentially have two files. We have our index.html, which is fairly short, and our hungry.js, which is the JavaScript file and is a little bit longer. Whenever you're working with any API, whether it's from Google or from another company, it's important to read all the documentation. The Google Maps API has changed a little bit in recent years. So when I made this application, I was kind of surprised at some of the details. So always read the docs before you start working with an API. So this particular application, of course, we start with our doc type declaration and our HTML tag. In the head section, we just have our character set in a meta tag, the title, which is Maps API App 2019, and then the viewport tag, which sets up our screen to work well on a mobile app. Then for the style, we actually have a div down here called Map. That div fills the screen and is where our map is displayed. You have to give this a height or the map won't display. So my height is 100% to have the map fill the actual screen. So make sure when you're working with Google Maps, the div where your map's going to appear has a height. For the HTML on the body, set the height to 100%, zero margin, zero padding. So our application goes all the way from one edge of the browser to another, or would fill an individual mobile screen. And that's really all the CSS, because all of the map styling comes through the API. So then real quick here, we have our div for the map, and that fills the entire screen, as I mentioned. We have our key for the API. Always keep your key secure and safe, but realize other people can get at it. Now, Google does charge for excessive use of the Maps API. I'm going to be using it so little that I won't get charged, but be aware that in order to get your key, you've got to go to Google's developer site, get a key, and attach it to your Google Pay credit card or whatever you have. But here in testing, you're probably not going to use it enough to get charged. All right, and then we attach the hungry.js. That's my JavaScript. And then taking directly from the actual Google documentation, we use the script here, and this access is the Google Maps script. You can see my key. The callback init map, this is the name of the initial function that runs to set up the map. And the libraries I wanted to include was places. That gives me the Google Place information that you see here. 
So again, all this came from the actual documentation. I just copied and pasted and added my key. Now hungry.js. So this is essentially where the action is. This is all the JavaScript that makes our map work. So init map, you remember, runs first. And the reason that runs first once again is because I called it as a callback right here in my link. Callback init map. So this is going to make sure init map runs first in our JavaScript. So initially I set my map reference to null, and then we get into the init map function. So first of all, I created location as a generic object. A generic object is essentially set up in memory as an object, but it doesn't have any properties, doesn't have any methods. It's just essentially a holding space for an object. And then we called navigator.geolocation.getCurrentPosition. So this is JavaScript to access from the geolocation object in the browser or device, the get current position function. That returns the position object with latitude and longitude. So the position object, you can get the latitude through position.quords.latitude, and I set that to the latitude property of my location object. Position chords longitude was set to the long property of my location object. So the only role of the location object is to store both latitude and longitude. It makes it convenient to pass that to a new object since it passes all the properties and their values. We then initiate the map. So our variable is map. We're setting that to a new instance of Google Maps.map. And then the first argument is, where are we putting the map? So we're putting it in the actual logical division, ID is map. So we get that with document, get element by ID is map. That's our first argument, is to get the actual div that's going to hold the map. The second argument is a little package of options. Where do we want the center? Well, we want the center at the latitude and longitude that was returned by get current position, which is where you currently are, your current latitude and longitude. We also want the zoom level. So the zoom level determines how far your map is zoomed in or zoomed out. If we change the zoom level quite a bit, we might be zoomed too far out or too far in. 15 is about right. This is about the neighborhood. So once we create the map, we're then calling get restaurants and passing it the location. And again, that location object has our latitude and longitude. The Google Places API and the Google Maps API used to be completely separate. Now they're somewhat married. So it actually works better because the Places API has an awareness of the map that you've built. You'll see that here in this next function. So the get restaurants function also knows our latitude and longitude. And it has a specific way of expressing your location. So we use from the Google API new, a new Google Maps dot lat long object that gets past the latitude and longitude. And we're assigning that to this variable here. For the places API, that gets three different options. The location, which we just created. A radius, around how many meters do we want to return information. And the types of places we want back. We want restaurants in this case. There are numerous categories, schools, restaurants, municipal buildings, hospitals, medical, police. In this case, since we're dealing with restaurants, that's the only category I selected. Now, we're going to go ahead and activate the Places API by passing it the map. Remember the map that we created. So we'll put that in an object called Service. So it gets a new Google Maps 
places, places service with the map, and then on that service object, we call nearby search, and then we have our request, which is the object with the location, the radius, and the type, and a callback function, which runs when the data comes back. This is obviously an asynchronous operation. We don't know how long it's going to take for Google to return the map and return the places. So the callback function here only runs when the data comes back. This makes it easier for us as we don't have to work with the asynchronicity of the API. So the callback here gets the results that come back from the Google Places API and a status. The status essentially says whether or not the query went okay. If it goes okay, right, if status equals equals Google Maps Places place of service status okay, then we can go ahead and loop through the results that came back and get information out of them. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at what's coming back from the API. I'm going to open our developer tools and let's go ahead and make sure we're in our console here. We are. I have this magnified a little bit. And what I want to do is I want to go ahead here and we'll use console log to log out the results object. So this time when the data comes back, and this is being pretty slow, we'll go ahead and see here the actual results. And now you can see the results that have come back. And if you look here, each one of these nodes is about a different restaurant. And if you look through here, we've got photos, we've got a place ID, price level and rating, which we're using. We've got a vicinity, which is the address and a name. So all this is part of the data that comes back from the API. We're going to use that data so, so when you click, we can display the information. Okay, so that's the results that come back. We don't need to actually keep that in the code, so I'll comment it out. So as we loop through each of these nodes here, right, for var i equals zero, i is less than results dot length, i plus plus, means we're just going to loop through all of these. I also could have used a for in loop if I wanted to. And we'll first go through, for example, node zero. So we'll take results zero, put it in the variable place. We'll get the price by going into the place and getting the price level node, right? So the price level node is right there, price level two. And I'm sending that to a function called create price. All the create price function does is takes the number and returns the number of dollar signs for that number. Or if there is no price, it returns a question mark. So this will turn two, for example, into two dollar signs, or it'll return three into three dollar signs. It'll return something it doesn't recognize into a question mark. And this only runs if we have a value here for level. So if it's blank or not null, then we or null, we return the question mark. So we don't have an error in there. So that's how we get the price, which appears as a number of dollar signs. Great Wall Chinese is one dollar sign. Beach House Sono is two dollar signs. Then we go ahead and we create a content variable, which is going to put together the content that you see in these little pop-ups. We have the place name in an H3, which comes from here's the place, and we get the name node right there. We get the vicinity, which is the address. You can see the vicinity node right there. We get the price, I already talked about that, and the rating, which comes straight out of the content right there, rating 4.1. So we essentially create a string here using string interpolation. Notice the single ticks and replacing the values directly in the string. That's got the HTML and the information about each individual restaurant. So we're creating within the JavaScript the HTML that's going to appear on the map when each pin is clicked. 
The marker object are each of these individual markers that you see dropped on the map, right here, here, here. So the marker object is created with a new instance of google.maps.marker, and we pass it the position of the marker, which in this case is going to be place.geometry.location, right? There's in here a geometry node and a location object, and this is used to drop the marker. It has a latitude and a longitude. The map that we're placing it on and the title, which comes from place.name over here, which we already looked at. So that's the marker object. We create an info window object by using new Google Maps info window and passing it the content. Remember the content we made up here based on the Places API? So we're wrapping that into a Google Maps info window object. So now we've created the marker object. We've created the info window object, but they're separate. So bind info window, this function, which passes the marker, the map, the info window and content binds the two together. Essentially on the marker, it adds a listener for a click event. So each of those markers is listening for a click event. And when that click event occurs, we're running this function, which sets the info window content to the HTML that's been passed in that we made up here. And on the info window, we set an open function on the map. So this is essentially marrying the individual info window and marker that we've created. Then to place the marker on the map, we call marker.setMap and feed it the map that we're setting it on. And that sets all these individual markers, one at a time through the loop, but it happens so fast, obviously, you can't see them being dropped. They all appear just to open together, and that's because the code obviously runs very quickly. So that's essentially the entire application. Once those markers are dropped, each one of them is listening for a click event, and when that click event occurs, the info window pops up. And again, all the information I use to make this short but very useful application is available inside the Google Maps API documentation. I suggest you read those and then maybe make some modifications to the application we have here because there's certainly a lot more information in the API that I'm not using. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this application as much as I did. My name is Mark Lassoff. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget, go ahead and click the like button, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you next time.